Solve murders and shootings across Baltimore. Some citizens won't give information to police because they fear retaliation. We're questioning what city leaders are doing to try and keep people safe. Vacant homes back in the spotlight after a five alarm fire in southwest Baltimore. The safety concerns these buildings pose and why they're putting entire neighborhoods at risk. It is very reckless for people to be talking about or asking about mass mandates when we are taking them away, when we've lost that many people, over 900 people in the COVID. Mayor Brandon Scott dismisses our questions about the science behind Baltimore's mask mandate, why the mayor's own actions are raising questions about that mandate. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 News at 10. And good evening, everybody. I'm Mary Bubala. And I'm Kai Jackson. Baltimore's closing in on 100 murders for the year. 96 people have been killed this year. 184 have been hurt in non-fatal shootings. No arrests yet in some of these recent shootings, including the murder of a DPW worker who was shot Friday with his co-worker while sitting in their truck in North Baltimore. A five-year-old boy was grazed with a bullet while taking a bath in his southwest Baltimore home. Well, tonight we're questioning what it will take for people to come forward with information and what city leaders are doing to keep those people safe. Keith Daniels joins us live with more on this. Keith? Well, Mary, video surveillance footage is often a key piece of evidence in cases for police, but when they come forward, when they come forward, testimony from witnesses can also be crucial. In Baltimore, the latest plea to the public from police. Please contact our homicide detectives right away. More outrage from the mayor. We have to be fed up. We have to be pissed off. Familiar appeals to the people of the city. We know someone saw something, heard something. Another bid for residents to help catch a suspected murderer. In this case, DPW worker Davon Mason shot and killed while on the job Friday. Investigators hoping someone saw something and will say something. But in a city gripped by a history of a silent culture. I think most people are scared to come forward, to be honest with you. The so-called no snitching attitude, some residents keep quiet, unwilling to help police. Because we're scared. And you're scared that if you tell on someone for seeing something, that it could be you next. What will it take to make people comfortable to come forward? We took that question to city leaders, including Councilman Mark Conway, who represents the district where Mason was gunned down. We also wanted to know, what are you doing to help end the keep silent culture? Conway's email was sent just before 4 o'clock today. Still, no answers. But Bishop Gregory Dennis of Act Now Baltimore. In order for the conviction to come, you've got to have the witness. A faith-based group aimed at bringing accountability to leaders inside City Hall says the first thing that must be done to make people come forward is to make them feel safe. But we also have to make sure that there is um, some accountability that if I come and I tell you what I saw, will there be a guilty verdict? Will there be retaliation? Can you help watch over my residents and my community to make sure that I'm protected when I say something or if I see something? If I see something, I'm, I'm going to say something. They out here, they're killing kids now. They don't care who they shoot. They don't care who they're killing. Speaking out when trying to catch a killer. Well, according to a statement from the police department tonight, the chief spokesperson, it reads in part the department is seeing an increase in tips from the community, an indication they say that people are now feeling, quote, enough is enough. Reporting live tonight, Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Keith, okay, thank you. We're learning new information today about the deadly shooting involving the DPW workers. Police have identified the man who was killed as 32-year-old Davon Mason. The other man shot has been released from the hospital. Police say the men were in a location outside their assigned barracks and were in that location for a while before the shooting. Baltimore police announced an arrest in one of the city's most recent murders. Daya Jones is accused of shooting and killing Nakia Jackson last Monday on Woodbourne Avenue in North Baltimore. Baltimore police say Jackson was able to tell them important information before she died, which led to the arrest. They also say Jones has confessed to the killing.
Well, tonight we're questioning how Baltimore is balancing the need for immediate action while also addressing the root causes of violence. Mayor Brandon Scott and Senator Chris Van Hollen taking part in a discussion of reimagining public safety. This includes creating and funding alternatives to police involvement in certain situations like a mental health crisis. And when it comes to addressing the everyday violence in Baltimore, both say the focus should be on guns. We've been actively engaged with uh, the ATF and others uh, regarding the, the, the weapons that flow into Baltimore City uh, from outside uh, the state. We know that over 50 percent uh, of the crimes committed in Baltimore City uh, come from, you know, guns coming from outside of the state of Maryland. 63 percent of the guns that we recovered last year came from another state. 84 percent of the guns that we recovered came from outside of the city of Baltimore to include other jurisdictions in Maryland. Mayor Scott also insisted there's still a plan to go after repeat violent offenders. He says officers are trying to get them off the streets and put them in a place where they can be rehabilitated. Now to another decades old problem in the city, vacant homes. According to the city, there are more than 15,000 vacant or abandoned buildings in Baltimore, impacting almost every neighborhood. The issue is back in the spotlight after a five alarm fire tore through 10 abandoned homes in the Carrollton Ridge community in southwest Baltimore. Well, that blight is leading to new concerns for safety with the recent rise in fires inside vacant buildings. There's renewed calls to have them better secured or torn down. Dan Lamparello is live questioning why more isn't being done. Dan. Well, Kai, with those more than 15,000 abandoned homes across the city, many of them are in dire need, uh, in dire uh, states, rather, of disrepair, leading to a lot of people being able to get access to them right from the street because those uh, things are, are taken down from the, the, the front of those buildings. Uh, and it's putting entire neighborhoods at risk. Abandoned, burned out, and left to rot. It looks like the slums. <laughs> It's sad. It really is. That's the reality along entire blocks in West Baltimore. I'll be 33 in September. Half of these vacants have been vacant since before I was even born. And that's, that's sad. That's really sad. And while many of those homes have been left to the elements, others are being broken into, leading to increases in crime and creating even bigger safety concerns. They go in them, they, they live in them, they shoot crack or smoke dope or whatever they do in them houses. And they're killing themselves, they're setting these houses on fire. Since last week, at least a dozen vacant or abandoned homes have been burned in this section of the city, including a fire that spread to 10 other homes on Friday. A lot of these vacant homes are in very bad condition. Rich Langford with Baltimore's Firefighters Union says those vacants pose a danger not only to firefighters, but to the entire community. The insides are open up, there's no roof, so the fire spreads very quickly and just walks down the block, as you've seen twice last week. With so many abandoned homes in this district, we tried to question Councilman John Bullock about why more isn't being done to secure them. We called and even emailed the councilman multiple times today, but he refused to get back to us. I really feel like we get failed every time. Even with like the elections and different things like that, we really get failed because they were always promised different things, but it is what it is. Leading to yet another neighborhood looking and feeling left behind. Now, the Baltimore City Fire Department tells us they do not track how many fires occur inside vacant buildings across the city. Ahead tonight on the late edition, we look into more, uh, look into why more of these buildings aren't being demolished. Reporting live tonight, Dan Lamparello, Fox 45 News. Dan, thank you. On the path forward now, new numbers show Maryland's COVID metrics are trending in the right direction. There is a 38% drop in new cases in the past 24 hours. Hospitalizations decreased by 30 in the past 24 hours, and the positivity rate is now below 5%. Governor Larry Hogan says Maryland's COVID-19 metrics are among the best in the nation. Last week, the state saw a 43% drop in new COVID-19 cases, which is the biggest drop in the country. According to new data, Maryland has the lowest transmission rate in the nation. 
But Baltimore City's strict mask mandate, it's still in place. Anyone over the age of two must wear a mask at all times, even outside. With updated guidance coming from the federal government expected this week, we wanted to ask city leaders what's next. Mackenzie Frost tried to get some answers from Mayor Scott today, but he didn't want to talk about it. Good afternoon, everybody. Baltimore City Mayor Brendan Scott bringing Johns Hopkins doctors and the health commissioner together today to talk about church services resuming safely during the COVID-19 pandemic. The metrics have been better. Anyone who has not been vaccinated should be worried about the possibility of serious COVID disease. But the city still has the mask mandate in place at all times, even outside when you can keep your distance. Mayor Scott, over the weekend, I think it was on Friday, you took your mask off a couple of times times to talk to the media while you're outside. The CDC is expected to announce some updates on outdoor mask wearing. Can you talk about the science behind keeping the mask at all times mandate in place outside especially? I figured this would be your question and it wouldn't be related to what we're talking about today. So I'll answer it and Dr. D, you don't have to. We're gonna to continue to follow uh, the guidance that we get from Dr. D and the individuals you see with us. Uh, it is very reckless for people to be talking about or asking about mask mandates when we or taking them away when we've lost that many people, over 900 people to COVID. We don't look into a crystal ball and see that they're going to change things. They change them when they announce them. Thank you. Next question. Anybody else? I have one more. Thank you, everybody. Turning off his mic and walking away without taking my question, which would have been, where's the science to prove outdoor mask wearing helps prevent the spread of COVID-19? Scott pointing to the Johns Hopkins doctors behind him as people who are advising him. But I spoke with the Hopkins doctor today. Epidemiological data shows that outdoor transmission is extremely rare. Dr. Amish Adalja says unless you're at an outdoor concert or a rally, outdoor mask wearing isn't necessary. I don't think that uh, wearing a mask adds much benefit, and I think uh, this is something where you'll see the guidance change. Still ahead on Fox 45 News at 10 o'clock tonight, proof that there's a lack of transparency in Baltimore County Public Schools. The questions Fox 45 has asked that seem to be falling on deaf ears. City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby continues to push her progressive policies, how she's trying to get the public on board. A major warm up with temperatures moving back into the 80s, but I'm going to let you know how long that's going to last and when showers and storms could end it all. My Weather Authority forecast. Project Baltimore tracks down an apparent ghost student. Why he tells us it's impossible for him to have been going to Augusta Fells during the 2019 school year. Tonight, Project Baltimore tracks down an apparent ghost student who attended a West Baltimore high school now under investigation. As Chris Papps explains, this student and 20 others were kept on the rolls even though they apparently stopped attending school. In this student's case, he hadn't been there for years. Are you familiar with anything that Fox 45 has been reporting about Augusta Fells? This man. I attended the school from like 2014 up until like 2017. Now 22 years old is a former student at Augusta Fell Savage Institute in West Baltimore. Basically the beginning of 2017 all the way up in 2019 or whenever was going on I signed up for no classes. I was dropped out left the school, didn't enroll back in the school or nothing. His former school is caught up in a scandal, currently under an internal investigation by North Avenue for grading irregularities and enrollment issues. I'm going to show you your transcripts. OK, that's fine. Fox 45 News wanted to speak with this man because his name appears on this list obtained by Project Baltimore of 21 seniors enrolled at Augusta Fells in 2019. These students were enrolled even though it appears they were not attending the school. Some 
hadn't for years. Yeah, I know none of them classes. I never went. Ghost students, as they're known by educators, can be used to inflate enrollment numbers and increase the tax dollars a school receives. These 21 potential ghost students would mean taxpayers likely paid North Avenue more than $330,000 to educate students who were not there. To be honest, I really have no idea. This student confirmed to Project Baltimore he could not have been going to Augusta Fells in the fall of 2019 because he was in jail. August, from August up until December. So from August to December of 2019, you were incarcerated? Yes. Court records show in August 2019, this man was arrested on drug distribution charges. But in October of that year, his name appeared on this list of students enrolled at Augusta Fells, even though he wouldn't be released from jail for another two months in December of 2019. And you can't think of any reason why your name would be on that on the rolls of that school? No, not at all. And the questions go back even further than that. This man said he stopped attending Augusta Fells long before his 2019 arrest. He told Project Baltimore he dropped out in early 2017. But for two more years, according to his transcripts, someone enrolled him in classes like Algebra 2, College Readiness, and English 4. They never said I was enrolled, or they never reached out saying I had to come back or anything. City Schools receives nearly $16,000 per student every year from taxpayers, meaning if this man stayed on the rolls of Augusta Fells for two years after he dropped out, as records indicate, North Avenue would have received nearly $32,000 to educate just this one student who says... He was not there. As I can see in the transcripts, yeah, I'm basically a ghost student, but I didn't attend, didn't enroll in the class or anything. I've been gone since 2017, buddy. North Avenue told Project Baltimore it will not discuss the potential of ghost students at Augusta Fells until after its internal investigation is complete, though they will not say when that will be. The Inspector General of Education in Maryland, Rick Henry, did confirm the Fox 45 News he is aware of the allegations of ghost students and is looking into it. I'm Chris Pabst, and this is Project Baltimore. Well, last month, a Project Baltimore investigation found nearly half of a Baltimore City class had a GPA of 0.13 or less. Since then, we have been pressing local leaders for some critical information surrounding the incident. But to this point, some of our questions seem to be falling on deaf ears. It's been nearly two months since Fox 45 News first learned about the problems at Augusta Fells Institute, where almost half of a class scored a .13 GPA or lower. Since then, another issue emerged at Augusta Fells, potential ghost students, where students were kept on class rosters even though they weren't attending classes. This gave Augusta Fells funding for students who weren't even at school. That's when we turned to City Councilman Robert Stokes for answers. He chairs the City Council Committee responsible for overseeing education. We asked him why he didn't ask the city school CEO about potential ghost students during their public hearing on April 8th. We also asked if he had contacted law enforcement about the issue and whether he thought it constituted fraud. Lastly, we asked if the potential ghost student issue existed across the city beyond the walls of Augusta Fells. But Councilman Stokes refuses to respond to these questions. In light of the issues at Augusta Fells, Fox 45 News also turned to the Baltimore Teachers Union for input about how city schools are being run. In that letter, we asked if the city school system is spending money properly, what challenges the union sees with teacher recruiting, whether or not the city can recruit highly qualified teachers, and who the union holds responsible for the Augusta Fell situation. Just like our letter to Councilman Stokes, we are yet to receive a response. On top of the letters to Councilman Stokes and the Teachers Union, Fox 45 News has a pending public records request with the city school system, seeking information about absentee and graduation rates to see if the issues at Augusta Fells are widespread across the city. The city school system still has a few more days to respond to our request. And Adam Angelewski from OpenTheBooks.com says North Avenue has an obligation to release those records. Here's what the administration of the Baltimore City Public Schools needs to hear. 
that information is already owned by the public. What Project Baltimore is following is a statutory process on open records law simply to take possession of information and documents that the public already owns. Well, Fox 45 News previously won a lawsuit against Baltimore City Schools, forcing them to hand over public records. Now, those records ended up showing evidence of grade changing. We're going to continue to push Baltimore City Schools to release information the public, you all, have a right to see. Project Baltimore is committed to giving a voice to the voiceless, the students, parents, and taxpayers who rely on public schools and expect better. If you're a parent or teacher who believes Baltimore City Schools has failed to provide students with an adequate education, Project Baltimore wants to hear from you. You can call us at 443-377-3108. You can also email us at project at foxbaltimore, projectbaltimore at foxbaltimore.com. And we held a town hall with experts uh, on the education crisis in Baltimore. You can watch that town hall right now on our website, foxbaltimore.com. New information about Maryland's COVID-19 numbers. What we're learning about the state's positivity rate. I'm Scott Thuman in Washington, where President Biden is preparing to address the country on his first 100 days and what's next, while Republicans complain there's one big campaign promise on which he failed. All right, welcome back, everybody. After a real beauty today in the mid to upper 60s, temperatures now falling down through the 50s, and I think we're headed on our way to the 40s, potentially for many neighborhoods by tomorrow morning under mainly clear skies. It's a warm front that's to our north. Well, you don't see the warm front, but you do see the rain and the snow that's up in the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan, and that warm front is going to lead in some warmer air for us. Take a look at the bus stop forecast for tomorrow. Drop-off time, mostly clear skies. Yeah, jacket here. 47, 72 at lunch, and there you go. 80 degrees potentially as we head toward pickup time, and this is not even the warmest we're going to get this week. I'll let you know we could make a run at 90 in some neighborhoods. That's in my Weather Authority forecast in a couple of minutes. City State's attorney Marilyn Mosby pushing her progressive policies. Why her policies are still not clear to some city leaders. Concerns over Johnson Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine after its brief pause. How Republican lawmakers are working to reduce vaccine hesitancy. New information in the deadly police involved shooting of Andrew Brown. What Brown's family is asking for after watching part of the body cam footage. In a city in crisis, there have been more murders and non-fatal shootings so far this year compared to this time last year. So far, 96 people have died, 12 more than this time last year. 184 people have been hurt in shootings this year, 14 more than this time last year. Now, the rise in crime comes as City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby stops prosecuting low-level crimes to focus on violent crimes. Even Police Commissioner Michael Harrison is now on board. I have to rethink that. You know, when we have information about violent crime or serious crimes that have taken place or information about the person driving the vehicle, whatever violation they may have committed, you know, those traffic stops, we certainly want our officers focusing yeah. on the more important things, which are violent crime. It's certainly time to revisit when and how we, we do those traffic stops. Local leaders aren't addressing violent crimes committed with guns in the city, according to some critics. Former Baltimore Police Department Com Deputy Commissioner Jason, jo Jason Johnson says it creates confusion and actually hurts police investigations. So-called routine traffic stops result in finding people who are wanted for serious crimes, recovering firearms, taking people off the street who are not licensed, not insured, uh, are intoxicated, you name it, any of those things that uh, are really very harmful to public safety, they come from traffic stops. And so I think we need to put this talk aside and focus on holding people accountable who are threatening the safety of the city and not always blaming the cops. Johnson says the commissioner should revisit what he said about traffic stops and clarify what he really means. 
Well, tonight we have team coverage on the effects of not prosecuting low level crime. There are plenty of cities across the country using similar prosecuting policies like Mosby's plan. People who live in these cities, though, say it's becoming more dangerous. More on that in just a moment. But first, Mackenzie Frost with more about the confusion over Mosby's policy. One month to the day, Baltimore City State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby made it official. There is no public safety value in prosecuting these low-level offenses. Her office will stop prosecuting drug possession, trespassing, prostitution, and other misdemeanor crimes. It was March 26. The homicide total, 69 people dead. Fast forward to today, April 26th, 96 people have been killed and 184 people shot, including five-year-old Cody, who was taking a bath with his sister when he was grazed by a stray bullet. What is going on right now is a disgrace. The public growing outrage, telling Mosby during one of her town halls since launching the new policies to make Baltimore safer. How many more people have to be killed for our state attorney and other officials understand that what's, what you guys are doing is not working. Mosby taking the plan around the city. We need the community's buy-in. Trying to persuade the public her policy shift to stop these prosecutions will help free up resources to dig into the violence. It's counterproductive to use our time, our energy, our resources on these low-level offenses. The possession policy is not clear to elected leaders. What I'm struggling with is understanding where the line is drawn. So can, can you help quantify for me because I wasn't, I, I'm still confused. So the one thing I will say is that this is not something that can be quantified. While the public awareness push continues. It can take people's attention off matters. Richard Vance, rhetoric professor at Towson University, says Mosby has a better record of garnering support from the community than putting people behind bars. If winning is getting support, then she can win. If winning is making your city a better place and making the quality of life improve, uh, she's got a big problem. That was Mackenzie Frost reporting. Baltimore police say officers are now instructed to gather information from someone they believe to be committing one of those low-level crimes, but release them afterwards. That guidance came three weeks after the policy was put in place. Baltimore isn't the only city with progressive prosecuting policies. Angela Brown continues our team coverage as some Americans believe the controversial criminal reform is making their communities more dangerous. These reforms are getting both praise and criticism. Activists are applauding progressive prosecutors and Democratic strongholds for not prosecuting low-level crimes like trespassing that could keep people in jail for months if they cannot afford bail. The critics say by not charging other offenses like prostitution, crime will go up. A bold move in the Big Apple. Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance announcing last week in this memo that his office will no longer prosecute prostitution and unlicensed massage, but will still go after clients. His announcement comes just weeks after Baltimore City State Attorney Marilyn Mosby made her COVID criminal justice policies permanent. Baltimore will no longer prosecute prostitution, drug possession, minor traffic offenses, and other low-level crimes. Mosby says violent crime is down 20 percent from last year. There is a culture of stigmatization and criminalization that is imposed upon black people in this country that you. we have got to change. That's one of the reasons why a month ago I came out and basically said, we're not prosecuting these low level offenses that have nothing to do with public safety. We have to stop relying on the police to respond to every social ill of society that for black people in this country can lead to a death sentence. Criminal justice reform is on the fast track by progressive prosecutors in Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, considered one of the most progressive DAs in the country, is not prosecuting minor marijuana possession or charging sex workers and is dropping cash bail for many infractions. Newly elected L.A. County D.A. George Gascon sent out this memo last December, listing a wide range of misdemeanors his office will no longer charge, including drinking in public, loitering to commit prostitution, and resisting arrest. Uh, this rogue prosecutor, or so-called progressive prosecutor movement, started well before COVID. Uh, and the policies they put in place are pro-criminal and 
anti-victim. These policies are getting pushback. An October commentary published in the conservative-leaning Heritage Foundation said that D.A. Krasner, by refusing to hold criminals to account, Krasner and his ilk abused the power of their offices and harmed victims, while some law enforcement officers say these policies could cause harm to victims as well. In some cities where these reforms have happened, there has been a spike in violent crime like Philadelphia. The question becomes, is the spike in crime related to the policy changes? In Washington, I'm Angela Brown. On the path forward, the state has surpassed a big milestone when it comes to vaccinations. Maryland has vaccinated more than 30 percent of the population, uh, crossing that mark on Sunday. Another two and a half million Marylanders have received one dose of the vaccine and are partially vaccinated. Well, there are some new developments surrounding the Baltimore based company that threw out 15 million ruined doses of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. The Washington Post reporting the CEO of Emergent Biosolutions sold more than $10 million worth of stock back in January and February. And that was just weeks before the company's stock price tumbled more than 50%. A company representative tells the Washington Post the sales were previously scheduled under the CEO's trading plans. Well, there is now broad distrust of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after officials paused its usage. According to a new Washington Post poll, 22% of those not yet vaccinated say they'd be willing to take it. Meanwhile, more than 70% say they'd be willing to take the other vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. Republicans say there are ways to reduce vaccine hesitancy. If the CDC announced that right now, that when we got to 70 percent, we could take our masks off, I think a lot of people would be less hesitant about getting that vaccine. So there is some difference between how Democrats and Republicans feel if you do this according to that poll. President Biden is expected to make an announcement on masking tomorrow. Last week, the CDC and FDA permitted the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to be administered again. It will be accompanied by a new warning label, uh, and the remote possibility of dangerous blood clots. 15 people are experiencing blood clots out of 8 million doses given. Well, millions of Americans are skipping their second coronavirus vaccine dose. The CDC says more than 5 million people have missed their second dose. That's about 8% of the population. Dr. Anthony Fauci told CNN it's not uncommon, uncommon rather, for this to happen with two dose vaccines. Obviously, whenever you have a two-dose vaccine, you're going to see people who, for one reason or other, convenience, forgetting, a number of other things, just don't show up for the second vaccine. A percent of 8 percent, I'd like it to be a zero percent, but I'm not surprised that there are some people who do that. The New York Times reports some of the missed doses are from a lack of supply. For help finding a vaccine, we put together a comprehensive guide. Go to foxbaltimore.com and click on the COVID-19 vaccination banner at the top of the screen. You'll see the statewide information and links to sign-up forms and information in each county. Well, this week marks President Biden's first 100 days in office. He'll deliver his first speech to a joint session of Congress Wednesday night. Sinclair's chief political correspondent Scott Thuman has a look at what the president plans to speak about. It's a chance for most leaders to convince the country they're much better off than they were under the last one. And Wednesday night, expect President Biden to boast of campaign promises filled, more Americans vaccinated, and checks in people's pockets. But there's also pushback on another promise. There will be no blue states and red states with me. It's one America. I work with Democrats and Republicans. Biden's almost $2 trillion COVID relief bill got zero Republican votes, and both his equally expensive infrastructure bill and soon to be unveiled American Families Plan getting crickets from the right. There was a bait and switch, is what we got with Joe Biden. He baited us, and everyone said he was going to be this moderate, he was going to be this bipartisan unifier, he was going to be a transitional president. And we've gotten the switch is that you have AOC endorsing his agenda. This is what he's talking about. You know, I'll be frank, I think a lot of us expected a much more conservative administration. Only fanning Republican flames, they've been left out. His speeches in the past, he's talked about unity. 
Uh, we haven't seen that at all from the Democrats in the first 100 days, not even close. This has been the most bitter uh, partisanship that I've seen since I've been in elected office over the last 100 days. Though Biden getting approval from 58 percent of the country, according to a CBS News survey, a majority calling his actions presidential, competent and focused. The White House says that right now, President Biden is working with his speechwriters and policy advisors to lay out details of the American Families Plan, but also to work better with Congress on how to pass things like police reform and more affordable health care. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. A D.C. pastor is facing a federal charge tonight. What he's accused of buying in Baltimore with loans meant for COVID relief. The Supreme Court agrees to hear a case about gun rights how it could impact state laws across the country. Vacant homes causing safety concerns across the city, what people are asking for, and how those homes are contributing to crime. And some crisp temperatures in the 40s to around 50 overnight tonight area-wide, but we could be doubling these numbers tomorrow and even more by Wednesday. I'm gonna let you know how warm things are gonna get around here and when it ends. My Weather Authority forecast. In your national news, attorneys for Andrew Brown's family call his death at the hands of sheriff's deputies uh, serving a search warrant and execution they're allegedly covering up. Brown's family was allowed to see a portion of one video from that deadly shooting in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Attorneys claim Brown was in his car with his hands on his steering wheel when multiple deputies started shooting. They want a full release of all video and everyone involved to be arrested immediately. We do not feel that we got transparency. Okay. We only saw a snippet wow. of the video. They only showed one body cam video, even though we know there were several body cam videos. The sheriff also wants that video released. The family says the county attorney is standing in their way. Family attorneys plan to release findings of an autopsy they ordered tomorrow. Attorney General Merrick Garland is launching an investigation into the Louisville Police Department. Louisville's mayor and police chief both came out in support of the investigation. They say it did not come as a surprise and is a good thing for the community. Both reiterated that change has already been taking place and this will only further their progress. When you have the DOJ coming in and providing pointed feedback, resources and assistance, it only shores up what we're already working on. We're already working on this, but this is like a force multiplier um, on steroids coming in. Well, the Louisville Police Department is still facing criticism over the death of paramedic Brianna Taylor. She was killed when police entered her home using a no-knock warrant. Making headlines now, three suspects have been arrested and charged with a deadly double shooting last week in Prince George's County. The 18-year-old woman who died was pregnant. You can see the three suspects on your screen. Police say two of them helped the shooter get away. The pregnant woman's baby was delivered during emergency surgery. The baby is expected to live but is still in the hospital. The other woman who was shot is expected to be okay. Well, a D.C. pastor is accused of using loans meant for COVID relief to buy a Tesla and property in Baltimore County. Rudolph Brooks Jr. is now facing a federal charge for wire fraud. Prosecutors say he filed fraudulent tax returns to get a $1.5 million, citing his car dealership as the reason for the loans. They also say he used a defunct company to buy property in Windsor Mill. He was arrested in late March. Well, a man is dead after protecting a 14-year-old girl and her mother from an attack in Chicago on Friday. Police say the girl's mother was working as a cashier at a store when her daughter asked her about a water bottle. The man thought she was cutting in line and allegedly started punching her and her mother. Humberto Guzman tried to help, but police say the attacker stabbed him multiple times. He died a short time later. The suspect was caught and is facing multiple charges. 
All right, get a load of it there. Beautiful look. Downtown Inner Harbor Cam, Toyota H Inner Harbor's, uh, Harbor Camera, uh, just a couple hours ago, actually showing the super pink moon glinting right off the Inner Harbor. I have it on my Facebook page. Go ahead and log in and you can see it there. But uh, right now, the, uh, the moon has kind of moved away. But nonetheless, take a look outside, take a look up, and maybe you'll see it there. The super pink moon is the, uh, well, the first super moon, large moon, brighter moon uh, of the year. We call it the pink moon because, well, it's not pink, but it actually kind of uh, occurs when we have the uh, the flocks, the uh, the flower, the flocks. It's pink uh, blooming this time of year, so that's why we call it the super pink moon. Nonetheless, you can see it with a clear sky, dry conditions, crystal clear. In fact, 53 right now. Temperatures are beginning to cool down. The air is still fairly dry, so it still uh, kind of warms up during the day. It really cools down efficiently during the overnight as we're still kind of in springtime with those longer overnights still hanging back. Temperatures all in the 50s right now, even some low 50s at East, and I think we'll be in the mid to upper 40s by early tomorrow morning with this fair weather high pressure. Our fair weather friend, really our weather maker uh, today with the temperatures in the 60s, and it will be tomorrow as well, but it's going to move off to the east. What does that mean? Well, it means warmer air starts to move in ahead of another weather maker that gets going across the Midwest with rain and some thunderstorms. That's going to be developing out to the west from Minneapolis to St. Louis, Chicago southbound. But we've got acres and acres and miles until we get to that. So ahead of that, the warmer air is thrusting in out of the Gulf of Mexico. Look at that 81 at Omaha right now. You're in the 90s today. Temperature at 70 at Oklahoma City, 75 at Dallas. We're in the 50s, so this is somewhat cool. Uh, also, the uh, area here around Seattle as well as uh, Salt Lake City, they're somewhat cool as well. But in the middle is where the warmth is sprouting up. And eventually that system out west is going to kick that to the east. And that's what's going to happen by tomorrow afternoon as our warm front moves to the north with the uh, rain and snow that you see here uh, north of Detroit into the upper peninsula of Michigan. We're not going to see anything like that. But we are going to get a couple of stray clouds overnight tonight as that moves through. And then once, once that warm front's through, you're going to feel... The big difference is tomorrow. It's going to be about 15, 20 degrees warmer. So we start off with temperatures at 11 p.m. in the 40s and 50s. We drop down into the mid to upper 40s by about 2:45 a.m. Early risers tomorrow. We're well down into the 40s, so probably going to need the jackets for the kids heading to school early. It's almost like a, a desert climate here with the cold overnight. And then look at this during the afternoon tomorrow at noontime. 70 Westminster, 74 Columbia, 71 in Baltimore, and easy. I think we're up uh, into the low 80s in most neighborhoods. This computer model saying that some spots could even make it to uh, the mid to upper 80, some of the warm spots like downtown Baltimore, maybe down the 95 corridor. But I think most folks are going to be about 80 to 82 tomorrow. We could tack on another five degrees potentially by Wednesday, though. So then it will really start feeling like summer. So for tonight, 43 clear skies. Tomorrow it's 81, bright and warmer, a touch of summer, I'm going to say. And your seven day forecast, 87 on Wednesday. Beautiful day there with sun and clouds. And then some spot showers Thursday, but still staying warm. A third day in the 80s likely with a high 85. Some showers, maybe even rumble of thunder on Friday. That's a cold front slinking through with 74. The bottom falls out a little bit, I think, on Saturday as we go back down to the breezy low 60s. How about uh, maybe some mid to upper 30s north and west, especially Saturday night into Sunday. May even have to cover the plants. And then it warms up again. That's how springtime goes into early next week. Guys. Jonathan, thank you. Murders in Baltimore remain unsolved, some because of witnesses too afraid to come forward. What city leaders can do to help keep people safe. New information surrounding the company in charge of producing in Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine in Baltimore when the company CEO reportedly sold $11 million in stock. And Cedric Mullins had a big night as the Orioles make it two wins in a row. Bruce Cunningham has the highlights coming up next in Sports Unlimited. After snapping the Oakland A's win streak at 13 yesterday, the Orioles were looking to keep the momentum going tonight as they opened a four game series with the faltering New York Yankees and the birds wasted little time getting going like the second pitch of the game. Red hot Cedric Mullins unloads on this one over the flag court onto Utah Street. That's his first home run of the year was one nothing Orioles bottom of the second Freddie Galvis to the gap in left center. Pedro Severino will come around to score and that made it two 
to nothing. Bottom of the sixth, our old friend Darren O'Day. Remember him on for the Yankees and watch. He balks. Austin Hayes was on third. He comes in to score. That makes it 3-1 Orioles. And then in the seventh, does Mullins have it grooved or what? Dead center field, his second of the night. That made it 4-1. Now, that was an important run because this happened in the eighth. Urshela with a bases loaded single to left. Two runs apparently come in. But look, Aaron Judge thrown out at third by Austin Hayes. The umps rule the second run did not score before Judge was tagged. And the Orioles go on to win it 4-2. to That is their 10th win of the season. Football, the Orlando Brown trade to Kansas City is now official as he passed his physical today. The trade netted the Ravens four of the Chiefs draft picks, including their number one. And with the NFL draft beginning Thursday night, those will come in quite handy. There are a lot of opinions as to what the Ravens will do, but most agree that receiver, offensive line, and pass rush are the top areas of need. The latter especially so. That position is especially deep. Eric DaCosta on that coming up later. And that's not all. Danny Manning has officially joined Mark Turgeon's staff at Maryland. You'll hear from the former All-American at 1130 as Sports Unlimited continues. Bruce, thank you. The best crab cake in Baltimore is being crowned. The winner coming up next. Well, trendy now, you decided the winner in Baltimore Humor's Instagram Crab Cake Challenge. The championship came down to Pappas and Jimmy's Famous Seafood, and Pappas was chosen as the best spot in town to get crab cakes. And, of course, Fox 45 wanted to get involved. Our very own Traffic Jam Jimmy tasted all four finalist crab cakes, and Jimmy had so much fun working with Baltimore Humor. He now plans to eat his way around Baltimore, helping the community decide all the best places to eat. And here's where you come in again. We want you to decide what's next on Jimmy's taste test. Just go to Baltimore Humor's Instagram page and post what you want Jimmy to eat next, whether it's pit beef, burgers, ice cream, whatever, you name it, he will do it. Tune into Fox 45 Morning News. We'll announce what you picked right here on Wednesday morning.